I'm preaching and he's not because he's far superior. But here we are. You're stuck with me this evening. So the word of the Lord, Revelations chapter 3, verse number 7, says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. I want to preach to you tonight for a few minutes from this thought. From this thought. A message to a weary church. A message to a weary church. Let's pray. Lord, today, God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, for your spirit that we feel. God, I pray that you'd open our hearts and minds to receive and leave this place encouraged. In Jesus' name, God, amen and amen. You may be seated tonight in the presence of the Lord. Now, I want to give you just a very quick backstory to Revelations chapter 3 here. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. John the Revelator is writing the book of Revelation. He was on the Isle of Patmos. He had been exiled because they could not execute him. The hand of God was upon him. They tried to kill him, but he would not die. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. He's all alone, place of desolation. But in chapter one, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What a wonderful thing to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, there are people that come to church and there are people, there's people who try to find a form of godliness. But John, without any organ, without any piano, without any preacher, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And as he was in the Spirit, as he was in the Spirit, the Lord began to reveal a revelation to him. Now, we hear the book of Revelation, we begin to get scared. Because we think of death and we think of end times. But the revelation is not revelations. It's a singular revelation. Revelation is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is revealing himself in full power and demonstration to John here on the Isle of Patmos. And the book of Revelation is the only book and the whole Bible that promises that those that read it and study it will be blessed. Because the more you know about Jesus, the more blessed you're going to be. And so as we progress through chapter 1, we find out about Jesus. But in chapter 2 and 3, he begins to tell John about the seven golden candlesticks we know as the seven churches in Revelation. The first church he mentions is Ephesus. It's the church that has abandoned its love for Christ and his teachings. Then he mentions the church at Smyrna. Do you know that we're in the book of Revelation? And we're one of the only churches that didn't get judgment. Because it's the church that remains faithful amidst persecution. Then he mentions Pergamum, the church that compromises its beliefs. He mentions Thyatira, the church that follows false prophets. He mentions Sardis, the church that is spiritually dead. He mentions, I'm going to skip Philadelphia because we're going to come back to it. And then he mentions Laodicea. The church with the lukewarm faith. We hear about that one a lot. That I would that thou were either hot or cold. But because you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I can't think of a more disgusting word picture than to think that if I'm not hot or cold, God's going to vomit me out of his mouth. And that's all good and that all preach as well. But I want to focus tonight on Philadelphia. Philadelphia. When John takes his pen in his hand to write to the church in Philadelphia, he makes it plain that he is writing to a church under siege. Yeah. Philadelphia was a little church with little strength. She was a struggling church, one who was harried and harassed by enemies. A church that had possibly seen better days. Uh -huh. A church that had possibly had larger crowds. A church that may have been a shadow of what it once was. Uh -huh. Philadelphia, according to what we read here, was a weary church. But before we go too far down that line, let's remember that the message to Philadelphia doesn't start with their beleaguered condition. The message to Philadelphia starts with a reminder of who is on their side. John the Revelator says, These things that saith he that is holy, that is true, that have the key of David, that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. Who is he talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. 
Philadelphia may only have a little strength, but the one that is standing with her is the strongest of the strong, is the mightiest of the mighty. And before, and before we get around to acknowledge the fact that the church in Philadelphia is weary, first we must establish the fact that God is on her side. She's not much to look at, but she's mighty through God. She may not have as many members as she used to have. The finances may not be as robust as they used to be. The enemy may be harassing her on every side. And the, the fight may be wearing her down. But take notice that the Lord God Almighty stands with His true church. He has not forsaken her. He has not abandoned her. The message to a weary church starts with the acknowledgement that God is on her side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Here's the truth about Philadelphia. She may be weary and she may be weak, but she remains undefeated. Through the trial, she hasn't lost her faith in God. Through the storm, she stood on the promises of God. Though the enemy has tried to destroy her, though a multitude of voices have called on her to just give up and die, the Lord says, you have kept my word and not denied my name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. They were willing to suffer persecution for that name. They were willing to suffer harassment for that name. They were willing to suffer torment and adversity for that name. And because they had not denied his name, he stood with them. There's something to be said for a church that refuses to break. A church that may be tired, that may be weary, that may only have a little strength, but continues to hold fast to the word of God. The message to a weary church is that the Lord has seen your weariness and has seen the tenacity of your faith and he has set before you an open door. You say, Brother Brian, I don't understand what you're talking about tonight. I'm telling you that 2020 has been a year that would weary any good saint. When other churches have packed it up and packed it in, when church members have stayed home and said we're giving up and we're giving in, there are those that have said we're staying faithful to the house of God. We're going to continue to see the gospel go forth. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that your mind may not be weary tonight or your heart may not be vexed. But Jesus said, "Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me." I've come to tell you tonight that the Lord is on your side and God is for you and God is with you and God is with this church and he has set before us an open door. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. The church has a door. There's a lot of debate over what that open door is supposed to represent. My wife reminded me today, I was talking with her. Sometimes I talk with her about, I'm thinking about preaching, make sure I'm not got off the deep end. Yeah. We were talking. She said, your dad's real fond of that story about Andrew Jackson. And I knew immediately what story she was talking about. My dad loves President Andrew Jackson. He loves history, but he especially loves President Jackson. President Jackson was not known for being a great speller. And he wrote a letter. And in that letter, he spelled the same word three different ways. And one of, his, one of his underlings criticized him, said, Mr. President, you cannot spell this word wrongly. And you didn't even, you, you spelled it wrong. You know, at least Emery, last night I was helping her grade her spelling test. And she, uh, she spelled a word wrong, or a language paper or something. She spelled a word wrong, but she spelled it wrong the same way. But this guy spelled it wrong three different ways. <laughs> and he said, Mr. President, it's bad enough you can't spell, but you're not even trying to be consistent. And Andrew Jackson, I imagine he's kind of like our current president, looked him in the eye and said, you know what? How simple the mind that can only think of one way to spell a word. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of debate over what the open door is supposed to represent. I don't think it's a heaven or hell issue. I think it's up for some interpretation. Uh -huh. How simple the mind spiritually, the spiritual mind, they can only think of one way this door could apply to the church. Some say that it represents the church itself, and that's good preaching. To the lost, God has given his church as a beacon of light, a ray of hope in a dark world. 
that in this weak and weary church that has refused to close her doors, but has stood her ground and maintained her witness, God has established an open door to the kingdom of God that no man can close. Because of the testimony of their faithfulness, because they have kept the word, because they refuse to deny the name, God has established them as an open door for a lost world. Indeed, the church is shelter in the midst of the storms of life. The church, the Bible tells us, is a city of refuge, is a haven of hope, is a place where love and mercy flows, where forgiveness is found, where the grace of God reigns supreme. The church is a place of restoration. It's a place of redemption. It's a place of opportunity. It's an open door which cannot be found anywhere else in the world. You may say, why are y'all still having service in the midst of a pandemic? When other churches are shut down, y'all are still meeting. Because the church is an open door to a lost and dying world. Do you know we never, ever, and I'm not criticizing every church has to make their own decision. I'm not criticizing any church that's trying to be safe. We did it here for a month. But we never locked this door. You know, because we never locked this door, Sister Tammy and her kids started coming in the middle of a pandemic. In the middle of a pandemic. Didn't miss a Sunday. And are still here with us. All glory to God. Because the church cannot afford to shut down. It may go virtual. It may go however it needs to go. But the kingdom of God and the gospel has to be preached. Because it's the only open portal to heaven. To a lost and dying world. The message to a weary church may very well be that God is the one who opened the doors of your sanctuary. And no matter what you come up against, nothing in the world can shut the door that God has opened. The world has tried to close the door of the church, but it cannot. The door will stay open no matter what the world does. Communist China, in the midst of oppression, has a church. It's underground, but they have a church. Russia might have an underground church, but they have a church. The gospel will be preached throughout the world. My Bible says that this gospel will be preached in every nation, and then will the end of days come. You cannot stop the church. Times may change. Generations may come and go. But the door of the church will always be open. The world may think it has found a better way. They may argue that religion is not relevant anymore. They may get puffed up in vain knowledge and declare that they've become too smart for God. I read some statistics yesterday from Barna Research that grieved my spirit because it had statistics from evangelical churches, churches that are Baptist, Methodist, things like that, Pentecostal churches, Protestant churches like Lutherans and, and non-Catholics, but still very rudimented, similar to Catholics, and Catholic churches. I don't care what Catholics think, to be honest with you. I don't care what evangelicals think necessarily. I don't care what Protestants think necessarily. I am concerned with what Pentecostals think. And it grieved me to see that 56% of Pentecostals that were surveyed no longer believe in absolute truth. 60% don't believe that this word is infallible and inerrant. There is a difference between infallible and inerrant. Inerrant means it has no error. Infallible means it's the very breathed word of God that is perfect and settled. I believe everything this book says literally happened. Happened the way God said it happened. And it was without error. I believe it was passed down and preserved. I believe men have tried to destroy it, but they can't do it. You're not too smart. We're not too good. We've not gotten too fancy. The church was born in persecution, and it may go out in persecution, but it will not be stopped. Herod tried to kill it. Nero tried to burn it and persecute it. Governments the world over have tried to destroy it, but the church cannot be stopped. There will always be hurting and lonely and desperate people looking for a place of refuge, and the doorway to the church will always be open to them. You know why we took time this summer to send a youth group to Tiptonville, Tennessee? 
because that church had been borderline seeing its doors closed. And it grieved your pastor's spirit and my spirit and Sister William's spirit that any church would be close to being closed down. And God has sent a wonderful couple there that's doing a great work. But we went, we were a shot in the arm to them. It was good for us. It was good for them. But they're having 40, 50, 60 people now a Sunday. They've added three more families. That church is growing. That church is flourishing. That church is prospering. And can I tell you, I told, I told the Wilkerson's today at lunch, and this is no disrespect to that pastor. They're good people, but they're not fancy. They're not contemporary. You think the precious name of Jesus is old? I've heard some of the songs they're singing. They're singing some old songs. Can I tell you? There's a generation that's so hungry, they don't care what the song is. They don't care what the instrument is. They don't care what the message is. As long as the word is being preached and the spirit is drawing, come and drink freely of the water of life. They're thirsty for a move of God. The church has to be open. This door was opened by the Lord, and no man can close it. Uh -huh. Can I tell you that we have it in our bylaws, that this church was founded as the United Pentecostal Church International. Uh -huh. Now, no disrespect to my elder here. We love the UPCI. It's the best organization going. Right. But if they change the doctrine tomorrow, right. Right. we're not changing our doctrine. We'll leave the organization if we have to leave the organization because there's one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all, through you all, in you all. Acts 2.38 is still the way of salvation. Holiness is still right. We can change methods, but the message doesn't change. Now, I don't see that happening. We've got a good general superintendent. We've got good district leadership. The message isn't changing. I'm glad some of the methods have changed. They needed to. But... Pastor also has it in the bylaws that if something should happen to him, and let's just say, I'm not so vain as to think I am, but let's say I was elected pastor or another man was elected pastor and they decided they wanted to lead this church in the false doctrine. It is in our bylaws that this church is to be shut down and that the goods and property are to be sold to the United Pentecostal Church International so that an apostolic Jesus-named church can be replanted in Smyrna. Because we refuse to see the gospel shut down in the city of Smyrna. And I'm telling you, as long as I'm pastor here, or assistant pastor here, or whatever here, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the power of God to salvation, will be preached if I have to stand on a sidewalk under a cardboard box and preach it. The gospel is going to go forth to whosoever will listen. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It's an effective door. The gospel works. No power in hell is greater than this gospel. There's no sin it can't overcome. There's no bondage it cannot break. There's no enemy it cannot conquer. There's no devil in the world that could stop the church. She may be weary. She may be a little worse for the wear. But the door is a door that was opened by God. And nothing in this world has the power to shut that door. That door is open. Now, the church is unstoppable. I didn't say you were unstoppable. You got to make sure you're in the church. You got to make sure you've come through the door and you're part of the church and you're on fire for God. But the church, the door is open. Perhaps we could say it's a door of revival. There are others that say that the door represents revival. And indeed, God has promised revival to his church. 2 Chronicles 7 14. Through 16 says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen. Now we like verse 14. We quote that. But verse 16 says, now have I chosen. Lord speaking, and sanctified this house, that my name be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. God says, I've chosen this house. And God says, I have sanctified this house. I have my name here, and my name will be here forever and ever. 
I do believe there is an open door of revival. I do believe, and you hear me, and pastor's even joking. He's never criticized me, but he's joked about any time I preach, you're going to hear about revival because I believe revival is coming. Your families can be saved. Your children can be saved. Your neighbors can be saved. Your friends can be saved. They are going to come through an open door into the church, and they are going to come down an aisle into an altar, and they are going to find God here. Strangers driving down the street are going to feel compelled to stop and come in. Yes. I, memory fades. I may have it wrong. But Sister Bonnie. When you first found our church. Didn't the spirit just draw you here? Great. You got in the car. And the Lord. But she was so hungry for the Lord. And the Lord was dealing with us. When we were still over on Hazelwood. The Lord was dealing with her. And she got in her car. And she said. God. I need to know where you want me to go. And the spirit of God. Led her to the parking lot. At the Pentecost of Smyrna. And she's been with us. Been one of our dearest saints. Ever since. I'm telling you. There are people that are hungry. And the door is open. The Spirit is drawing and compelling folks to come into this house. I want to tell you that they are coming. Revival is coming. The message to a weary church is hang on. Help is on the way. The door is open because the lost world is getting ready to walk through that door. It's going to happen. I know it. They've been preaching about end time revival my whole life. My whole life, revival, 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 end time revival, latter day outpouring, and it's going to happen. I'm telling you, not only is it going to happen, it's already happening. Somewhere around the world, every four to six seconds, somebody is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. In the last days, His Spirit will be poured out upon all the earth. It's happening. It's happening. I'm telling you, it's going to happen here. The burden will catch on. People will walk through the doors who love this church, who will support this church. He will be willing to give their lives to this church because this church is the best thing that they will ever find in the world. This is not just another social club. You want to be in a social club? I can tell you where the Civitan Club meets. I can tell you where the Rotary Club meets. I can tell you where the Small Independent Merchants Association here meets. Brother Jeff can tell you all kinds of business associations and things you can be a part of. He's a mover and shaker in our community. There's plenty of social clubs to be had. This is not it. This is the best thing going on in the city of Smyrna. Because this is where heaven meets earth. And lives are changed for eternity. Bible study teachers are coming. We need Bible study teachers. You may not feel qualified to stand behind this pulpit and preach the word, but any of you are qualified to take a Bible study chart and teach somebody what the word of the Lord says in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Right. Bus ministry workers are coming. Yes. We used to have multiple bus ministry workers. It's not the will of God that Brother Kenny be the only one driving the bus. We need some people that would pick up the burden and say, hey, I want to drive the bus. Hey, I want to get a second bus. We got more people that want to come. We just don't have enough bus drivers to go and get them. Bus ministry workers. People who will knock doors. People who will share on Facebook and social media. People who will reach out to the lost. They are coming. It is going to happen. We may have just a little strength. We may feel like we're just few in number. We may not have much in the way of resources. But don't ever count the church out. Revival is coming. God has opened the door. And nothing in this world can close it. I'm just going to get real direct here for just a minute. Pastor's gone, so I'm feeling my weeds. I'm real there was already a church here in Smyrna at one time. Yeah. And the enemy closed it. Saw fit to lead it astray. But God, within just a couple of years, raised up this congregation. And we've been going strong 20 years. And I'm convinced that for some reason this one shut down, God would just raise up another. Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the revival church. Nothing in the world can stop the revival of the church. Uh -huh. The door. Some say the door represents a door of power. That the sick will be healed. The lost will be saved. Those who are bound will be set free through the power of the Holy Ghost. The hurting will find healing. The lonely will find a friend. The Spirit of God will settle upon His church. And the power of God will be loose to work like it is supposed to work in the church. 
It is the will of God that the anointing flow out of this house like a rushing mighty river. The prophet Ezekiel saw in the vision it flowing through his community to the homes of neighbors, through businesses, through city hall. He saw it flowing first at the house. It was shallow, but as it got out, it was deeper and deeper and flowed like a mighty river. It is the will of God that a spiritual awakening happen in the city of Smyrna. That nothing ever be the same again. That there wouldn't be any more ordinary services. That there wouldn't be normal Sundays. No more business as usual. That the power of God be loosed in the house of God. Every service being a demonstration of the power and anointing of God. I don't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. I come to you, Paul said, in the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. My words don't matter. What matters is that the Holy Ghost would touch somebody's heart and bring power to their spirit. Every time the people of God come together, God is going to show up and show out. Miracles should happen. Signs and wonders should follow the preaching of the word. Someone said, well, y'all are, are perverse because y'all are following signs. Jesus said they're perverted that follow signs. I'm not following after signs. My Bible says, Jesus speaking, that these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak in tongues. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. I don't look for signs. Signs follow me as a believer. As the Spirit leads, signs and miracles happen. Not for my glory, for His glory. To draw men to a place of repentance. Not because of anything we do, but because of the power of the Spirit of God that abides in this house and abides amongst His people. We may feel like we only have a little strength, but our God has more than enough power to make the mountains tremble, to cause the kingdom of hell to crumble. You might as well go ahead and blow the trumpet in Zion. Let it be known far and wide that the year of deliverance has come. The year of the Lord is upon us. This is a door that only God can open. And he's getting ready to swing it wide in the midst of his church. Get ready. Deliverance is in this house. Healing has come to this house. Broken homes can be put back together again. Years of spiritual bondage and depression are going to fade away in just a moment in His presence. In His presence, joy unspeakable and full of glory will fill this house. A peace that passes all understanding can be loosed here. There is a door that has been opened, a door of power, a door in the Spirit, a door of the Holy Ghost. I had a friend tell me one time, he said, I don't know if all that, that Holy Ghost stuff is essential. And I said, well, let's just say that you're right and it's not. Why would you not want to have the power of God flowing freely in your life? Why would you not? Want to have the power to pray for people and see healing and deliverance. Why would you not want to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and have victory for day-to-day -day living? Walking in the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. And finally, some say that the door represents a door of grace. Brother Wilkerson preached a wonderful message on mercy this morning. I want to take just a minute and preach a counterbalance to that. Of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It is help that I don't deserve. It is deliverance that I did not earn. No man can open the door to grace. That is God's business. Only he can open that door. Titus tells us that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's where the door of grace first opened. That Jesus appeared to all men. He's referencing John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus appeared in grace. He opened the door of grace. Hebrews 5 and 9 tells us, this verse used to trip me up. Because I had some friends, I went to a school of another faith, Baptist. Went to a school of another faith. And they believed in a doctrine called unconditional eternal security. That... They, they weren't full Calvinists because Calvin taught that there was nothing you could do to be saved and nothing you could be, do to be lost. Yeah. But they were half Calvinists because they taught that grace was greasy. That you could repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with some form of mental assent, and there was nothing you'd ever do to be lost. Yeah. The youth pastor literally looked at me 
and said, I'm telling you that I believe the grace of God is such that I could go out here after receiving salvation. I could get high. I could drive my car down Interstate 24 and hit a bus full of kids, see every kid in that bus die, and I'd die in that same wreck, but I'd still go to heaven. I'm sorry, friend, but that is making the grace of God of none effect. That is making it a travesty. God's grace is not greasy. God's grace is not cheap. But God's grace is open to whosoever will. But they would point to this verse in Hebrews, and they would say, they would say that, it says that he became the author of eternal salvation to whoever that believes. I'm paraphrasing. But the key part is he became the author of eternal salvation. And they would point to that, that, oh, it's eternal salvation. And I finally got the revelation one day that he is eternally the gateway, the door to salvation. Jesus Christ is eternally the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to salvation. But your individual salvation... Is not eternal. It is up to you to grab hold of the grace of God and walk in that grace and walk in that goodness and walk in that mercy day after day. And so the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I didn't learn it. I didn't cause it open. It's God's business. He opened the door through Jesus Christ. But when the door swings open, you better get ready because his grace is where my help comes from. His grace is where my hope lives. His grace will do so much more than just meet needs. But it equips us to fulfill His calling in our lives. When our resources run out, His grace steps in and takes over. When we've given all we have to give, when we've done all we know to do, His grace is going to make up the difference. He'll never abandon us in the fight. He will not fail. He will not disappoint. His grace is more than sufficient to meet every single need. We will be equipped to every good work, prepared and enabled to every ministry that He has called us to. There are ministries on these pews that haven't even been conceived yet in your mind. But God has called you to do things. You say, Brother Brian, I don't know. I'm telling you, if God is stirring you, can I tell you that if the Spirit is speaking to you and it's leading you to do something, the first voice you hear is not the enemy. It's not even yourself. When you're in the Spirit and you're praying and God begins to speak to you, call you to a work, that's His voice. The second voice you're going to hear is your voice, a voice of self-doubt. The third voice you're going to hear is the voice of an enemy that says, Oh, you're not worthy. You failed the grace of God. You can't do that. He's the accuser of the brethren. I told my Sunday school class this morning that the Word of God only speaks of three days. It speaks of yesterday, today, and that day. Yesterday is our past. Today is where we are presently. That day is an appointed time that God is calling us to and drawing us to. Specifically, the end that day is the day of His glorious return when He calls us to heaven. But, but the only person still dwelling in yesterday... Because he's not, not, he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. Is Lucifer, Satan, the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies, who all he knows is your past. And every chance he gets, he's going to bring it up and say, oh, you're not worthy. You can't do it. But the grace of God stands up and says, this is my child whom I've saved, whom I've called to a good work and a good purpose. He that began a good work in you is able to complete it. God wants to do a good work through his people. Then when all is said and done, you will step back and say, I don't even know where that idea came from. I didn't know I had that in me. I didn't know that God could use me like that. But I'm telling you, he's getting ready to give you dreams. He's getting ready to give visions. To visionaries, dreams, to dreamers, he's getting ready to issue callings and to establish purpose in the lives of his people. Because the grace of God has been loosed in this house. And when grace is loosed, it transforms everything. God has a better plan for your life. God has a greater purpose for you. His grace can empower you. His spirit can inspire you. You can get holy boldness that will come upon you. And you can walk into a harvest field with divine anointing on your life. Revival is going to happen. God is not waiting for someone else to come along. 
He's not looking for another group of people. He's not saying, well, if I could only get the right people there at TPOS. He's going to use what he has available. He's going to empower what is his. The grace of God has been loosed in his people. And so tonight as I close, Sister Wilkerson makes her way to the piano. The message to a weary church is that God has opened a door that no man can shut. We could talk all night long about what that might or might not mean. I think it means everything we've said and more. I think that what God is getting ready to do for His church is beyond the scope of our ability to comprehend. I feel like the Spirit is saying to the church, hang in there. Don't give up now. I know where you are. I know what you're going through. I want you to know that I have established you. You are the door to Smyrna. You are the door that God wants to work through. You are the gateway to a lost and dying world. Revival is coming through that door. The power of the Holy Ghost is about to flow through that door. The empowering grace of God is going to flow out of this house. You may be tired. You may be weary. You may say, Brother Brian, I've only got a little bit of spiritual strength left. But help is on the way. It isn't just on the way, but your help is here. The psalmist said, lift up your eyes to the hill from whence your Redeemer cometh. Your Redeemer is here tonight. He wants to give you help. He wants to lift you up. And so I close with this illustration tonight. I'll tell you the story of the gold miner. He toils long and hard. He braves the elements and sticks through the lean times. Through it all, he barely scrapes by. The mind never produces enough to amount to anything. Never more than a meager existence. Until finally one day in his weariness, he gives up. He buries his pick and he walks away. He's forever lost to the pages of his history. Years go by and a speculator moves in and buys that old mine shaft. He clears the opening, shores up the shaft, begins to make his way to the end of the tunnel, picks up where the forgotten miner left off. And six inches further into that dirt, he struck pay dirt. It was one of the richest finds of all time. Just six inches past where the miner had buried his pick and abandoned candle. The message tonight to a weary church is simple. Don't give up now. Whatever you do, don't stop praying now. Don't stop fasting now. Don't stop believing now. Somewhere in the heavens there is a door getting ready to swing open. There is a revival getting ready to take place. There is demonstration of the power and the grace of God that is getting ready to be made manifest. Whatever you do, whatever it takes, don't quit the fight now. Somebody tonight needs to settle the issue. Somebody tonight needs to look hell in the eyes and declare, I may be weak and I may be weary, but I'm still in this fight. I'm not going anywhere because greater is he that is in me than he that is against me. A door of grace is swinging open in this house right now. There's a sweet presence of the God. I wish we'd stand to our feet right now. I wish we'd lift our hands. I wish we'd begin to worship the Lord right now. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, we need you, Jesus. Lord, we can do nothing without you. Right now as the ministry team makes the way to the front. Jesus. Oh, Sister Williams, yes. Brother Alford, Brother Fernando. If you want to step out, you say, Brother Brian, tonight I've been weary and well-doing. I've come to tell you if you're weary and well-doing, don't faint. For in due season you're going to reap. But you say, Brother Brian, I'm weary tonight. Right now, I want you to step out. Let the ministry pray for you. You want to stay in your seat and worship? Stay in your seat and worship. The workers is going to sing. God's Spirit is going to move. Right now. Thank you for joining us for the Pentecostals of Smyrna online broadcast. We are honored that you would take the time to worship with us today. What a powerful message that we just heard. I hope it challenged and impacted you as much as it did me. Maybe you need to grow in your spiritual walk with God, grow in your faith, or maybe you've never started that walk. If you're new here to the broadcast and you don't know what it is to walk with Christ, let me tell you very simply how you can start that. The first instance we have of a group of men wanting to follow Jesus is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. They asked the preachers there at the day of Pentecost, Simon Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what do we have to do to be saved? Peter said, well, you got to repent. 
You've got to turn away from all your sin. But then you've got to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That means the washing away of all your sins. And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He went on to say that this is a promise. It's a promise unto those that are in that room, to their children, but also to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Those that are afar off means you and I, me here and you at home watching the broadcast. If you've never obeyed this gospel message, you can today. You can repent right where you're at, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You can call us and ask to come get baptized. We'd love to baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we'll pray with you to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We'll even do it all in a safe, socially distanced way. But we want you to obey the gospel. Now, I want to pray with you there at home. Pray that you would grow in your walk with God. Pray that if you need healing today, you could receive it. Whatever your need or situation may be. So why don't you join me now as we pray. Lord, I thank you today for the opportunity we had to gather together in all forms, whether in person or online, and worship your name. God, I pray that the word that was just preached would grow in the hearts of those that heard it. Lord, if they need to grow in their faith, that they would begin to grow, that the gifts that you have placed in them would be stirred, and, and that their faith and hope and love would be built up, God. Lord, if there's fear in their heart, I pray that you would cast that out, that they would feel your peace and joy right now. God, if they're in need of healing today, I just pray that your healing virtue would flow into their room across this computer screen or TV screen and touch their body. Lord, you're not limited by physical location, but your presence can be everywhere at all times. Let your healing virtue touch those that are watching now. And God, I pray, Lord, that if they need to obey Acts 2.38, they've never repented, they've never been baptized, and they've never received the Holy Ghost, I just pray that you would convict their heart right now. Give them the faith to step out and ask us to pray with them, to baptize them, for them to receive the Holy Ghost. God, just let all these things be done. To the glory of your name, we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me now, I'd ask that you would connect with us online at tpos.church. We can pray with you further over the phone or in person, or we can meet with you and do a Bible study there at tpos.church. You'll have the opportunity to email us your prayer need or ask us for a Bible study. We would love to connect with you and help you grow in your walk with Christ. Thank you again for watching. Be blessed.